Thank you, Art, and I think this is the optimal point to speak about national aspects. So it is my pleasure to invite Ms. Melissa Hathaway, President of Hathaway Global Strategies, bring, who brings a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional perspective to strategic consulting and strategy formulation for public and private sector clients. She currently serves as a member of many boards of directors of many companies, centers, and advisory boards. But most important in my view is to say that she serves as strategic advisor to a number of Fortune of 500 companies. In the government sector, Ms. Hathaway provides strategic advice to the US government, NATO, the Interpol, as well as numerous government around the world, and they develop and refine their national strategies for cybersecurity by her assistance. At Harvard, Ms. Hathaway is participating and contributing to the joint MIT Harvard project Minerva. She is contributing to the interdisciplinary research program by developing methods of measures, models, interpret and analyze challenges and response in cybersecurity and cyberspace. She's also a regular guest lecturer at both universities. Maybe the most significant point to mention is that in uh, 2002, uh, 2002, 09, I'm sorry, Ms. Hathaway served in the Obama ad administration as acting senior director for cyberspace in the National Security Council. In that capacity, she assembled a team experienced government cyber experts to conduct the 60 days cyberspace policy review. The president presented the blueprint of the cyberspace policy review, announced cybersecurity as one of his administration's priorities, and recognized Ms. Hathaway's leadership in conducting the review. In the next few months, Ms. Hathaway stood up the cybersecurity office within the national security staff to commence the work called for in that blueprint that she just published. At the conclusion of her government service, she received the National Intelligence Reform Medal for recognition of her achievements. And in my view, Ms. Hathaway is the best speaker to introduce us to the cyber readiness. Is any nation prepared? Please. Thank you very much. That was a kind introduction, and um, shalom and good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, General Ben Israel for this kind invitation, for Gilly, Ram, Roni, and all of the people who helped me get here. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here in Israel. This is my first time, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you about cyber readiness. Uh, this is a culmination of, uh, and an excerpt of some work that I've been uh, pulling together for the last year. Um, and for those of you who'd like to see the broader readiness index, I'd be happy to talk, talk about it at a break. And I'm dying for water here. So <clears throat> I, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the innovation and the um, ICT adoption. And one of my uh, uh, longtime mentors, Andy Marshall, um, who is the director of net assessment in the United States, who's advised every secretary of defense since 1972, uh, tells you that you need to look to your past to inform your future. So I'm going to give a brief history lesson uh, before I go into the, some of the challenges. Um, <clears throat> as many of you recall, it's a history that we've lived together through. And the first message uh, on the internet was an exchange of email between two universities in 1969, October 29th in 1969. And today we have more than 200 million emails that are sent per minute. In 1972, we had the very first attachment to that email. It was file sharing between the United States and Europe. And today, as you've heard uh, Art and others say that the the amount of data that is generated in a day could fill up football fields or soccer fields of information. In 1979, we had the very first automated cellular telephone network, and it was created by Nippon Telephone Telegraph in Japan. 
And today, mobile devices have penetrated more than 35% of the population, and there's more mobile phones per individual um, on Earth. And I would I venture to say, and I can't see the whole audience, how many people have more than one IP device on them today? And it's about 50% of the audience. <clears throat> The domain name system was created in 1983 to enable the global expansion of the internet. And in 1985, the top lane, uh, level domains were created. Of .com was, first create, was the first to allow for .net and, dot, uh, and dot so on. It's funny, if you talk to the actual uh, authors or the, the, the innovators of the internet, they had only allocated 15% of the address space for .com which is part of the reason that we have to now move from IPv4 to IPv6 because of the exhaustion of we never saw the global expansion and commercialization that we see today. <clears throat> that user-friendly information, search, uh, pay, connect. In 1992, the very first instant messaging developed um, and it was tested on a 2G network in Finland. And, um, and that was, <clears throat> allows for today's generation of revenue of more than $800,000 per minute. The ITU uh, granted uh, the interoperable standard for voice over internet protocol in 96, which gave way to more than voice over internet protocol. It also gave to video over internet protocol and the like, which gave born to Skype that came from Estonia in 2003. And today, many of you are watching music, or you're watching videos, you're listening to music, you're viewing photos, you're extending tweets, and all of that was enabled through that ITU interoperable standard for VoIP. And then finally, social networking technology emerged in 2002 with the uh, emergence of the first one was Friendster. It quickly went away and led to LinkedIn and et cetera. And now that 20% of the global population is using that social network and technology and is changing really the way that we live, work, and play. That's the innovation. The attack surface is great and the exploitation is even greater. And today, and within one minute, you'll see more than 135 botnet infections and 20 new identity theft victims. And that a decade from now, today we have 7 billion people, tomorrow 8. Today we have two and a half billion or 35% of the population with those internet devices. Tomorrow it'll be closer to 60%. Today we have an average of six devices per person. Tomorrow as we fit up our homes and our businesses with those IP enabled devices, it'll be closer to 10. And today we see this ICT innovation contributing to about 4% of our GDP for those developed nations. And tomorrow we're expecting it to be as much as 10%. And why is that? It's because government and industry leaders believe and are adopting that ICT that's driving change. In the old days, we had mainframes. I would argue we have mainframes again today. It's just called cloud. We went mini computer to the PC to desktop and now the mobile internet. And each of those innovations have allowed for productivity gains and efficiency gains among our countries. And it's in embedding it into every part of our life, whether it's the new buildings that have the IP-enabled devices, it's the energy with the control systems that we can actually ac access through the internet, or bring your own device to work and these mobile devices six in hand, the healthcare and, and actually enabling us to post our health records on the internet and enable a doctor anywhere in the world to pull from them the new industrial control systems and manufacturing capabilities that are being generated through the internet and the internet devices, and transportation, and retail, and public safety, and of course, underpinned by those IT uh, technologies and networks. In fact, ICT, at this point, is core to the industrial infrastructure modernization agenda. This chart comes from General Electric and uh, the World Bank, and it shows that over the course of the next 10 years, the ICT innovation and embedding into our core industrial manufacturing results in at least a $36 trillion opportunity, or 46% share of the global uh, economy. That's nothing that we can actually ignore. It's, in fact, everything that our countries are focused on. In fact, as I said earlier, the G20 countries are looking at this as the, the main level of growth, this being the ICT embedding in our infrastructures. And it's not just the GDP countries. For, those, uh, for the G20 countries, it's the developing countries are also seeing 10% GDP growth 
today and tomorrow maybe more than 10%. And that global dialogue on the security needed for ICT is also not new. Uh, the worldwide recognition came about in the year 2000 with the year 2000 programming bug, where uh, we wouldn't, hadn't thought about a four-year year. We actually thought about it as only a two-year year. And for then, many of you who are in the, interest, in the industry, you remember that we didn't know how to handle the zero, zero and the turnover. And we had incident response capabilities the computers wouldn't shut down. Then we had the recognition that key infrastructures, especially power, was more vulnerable due to the dependence of internet and the infrastructure. Those control system vulnerabilities that can turn on and off power grids. And we've seen some of those around the world. Cyber crime and cyber espionage or intellectual property theft are affecting the bottom line risk factors for many companies. It emerged right after the dot-com domain came about in 85. And then uh, in 19, the mid-1990s, cybercrime became more prolific. In the mid-2000s, we saw the configure worm of a general exploitation of the Microsoft operating system that necessitated international cooperation because those vulnerabilities, those core vulnerabilities of that main operating system that's got about 80% deployment around the world was leading to things like a Stuxnet or a Shamoon virus. And then, of course, the cable cuts in the Mediterranean that caused Egypt to go dark have, uh, have underlined the importance that the internet is not just what's on our core infrastructure or our geography or our land. It's also under sea, and it's not resilient either. Cyber activities impact and their impact vary, and more than 100 countries are cyber capable. Many of them and many non-state actors are now starting to increase the role in domestic and international politics. And many of our countries are talking past each other. And I'd like you to have six ways to think about this um, uh, challenge and a way to think about and how we might be able to talk to each other. Because we're not talking about the same things. And putting cybersecurity into an Uber umbrella is not helpful anymore. And we must uh, break down the problem into smaller parts. The first is we are seeing a lot of political activism on the internet. Uh, in the United States, uh, we were uh, very embarrassed by WikiLeaks and those trying to bring transparency to, uh, to the U.S. policies that they didn't uh, agree with. One could argue what's happening with uh, Snowden and, uh, and disclosure of data is also a political activism. Whereas in other parts of the world, you see political activism of using Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or the Internet to actually enable assembly to protest against the government um, and uh, perhaps causing regime instability. Political activism, though, is not the same as organized crime. Two or three weeks ago, we just saw a heist against one of our, uh, against many banks, the ATM machines. It was $45 million in 30 minutes in 30 countries. When I was in the Obama White House, it was 30 countries, 30 minutes, 30 million, 30, 30, 30, quite easy to remember. Organized crime is prolific. They're stealing our personal credentials, they're stealing our credit cards, they're stealing our banks, our real money out of banks. But that's not to be confused with intellectual property theft. Intellectual property theft of actually breaking in and illegally copying your plans and intentions of your next generation technology that's happening all around the world against all of our companies is uh, against the actual trade practices that we've all agreed to from the World Trade Organization. It's uh, economically, though, it's damaging many of our countries. <clears throat> but intellectual property theft should not be confused with espionage. Espionage is different. Espionage is state against state, and it's about stealing the plans and intentions of our governments, of what we intend to do internationally or what we intend to do domestically to promote our economic and political and military power. Intellectual property theft and espionage are very different, and in the United States, we've bundled that conversation, which makes it very difficult to get to an international agreement because many states, including ours, wouldn't actually abandon espionage, but I don't believe we conduct intellectual property theft. The last two are more important, I think, because we're starting to see them, and not many countries have a plan for what we're going to do with it. The first is the disruption of service. This is the distributed denial of service of our financial institutions. We're seeing it on a regular basis in the United States against our main banks, but we also saw it against the Shanghan Bank in South Korea most recently, 
which brought the Shanhun Bank, the fourth largest bank in South Korea, offline. And disruption of service could actually be disruption of critical services to any country. The last is destruction of property, true damage to property, whether that is the Stuxnet uh, virus or weapon that was used against the Iranian nuclear power plant, or the Shamoon virus that actually destroyed 30,000 computers in Saudi Aramco. They're both destruction of property. One was an overall uh, infrastructure risk to a nation. The other is a material risk to a corporation. And both have to be taken seriously by national and corporate leaders. And those tools are common that are being used against each of us, whether it's for political activism or espionage or disruption of service or destruction of property. And the reports are coming out on a regular basis among each of our countries. And ensuring the resilience of protecting our companies and our countries um, from these attacks and these intrusions and, these act and the activists is becoming more and more important. In fact, it's top of mind of many of our global leaders. The World Economic Forum, our commercial enterprises, listed cyber crime as the number one technological risk of 2012, and cyber attack is the number one problem in 2013, largely as a result of the Saudi Aramco event. <clears throat> President Putin of Russia has also talked about the importance of bringing this dialogue to a more um, uh, inclusive body within the UN and the ITU, and that this critical sphere of information exchange along our cybersecurity is most important to be done in an area where all nations are represented. In India, we're talking about cybersecurity um, <clears throat> as an important part of overall government to citizen and business to business uh, uh, enterprises and that it must be secured in order to enable that payments of employees and vendors to enable the flow goods, of goods and services. And then of course President Obama talked about this as one of the most important economic and national security needs facing our nation. Accordingly, now I'm going to caveat this, is that I've identified at least 30 countries that have cybersecurity strategies. If I miss your country, please come and talk to me. And if I have the wrong year on your country, please come and talk to me. Um, and uh, so this is first is the colonies of the United Kingdom and, uh, and uh, the first five. And I'm going to go quickly through this. And I hope you see your country's flag. You see many of the European countries all published around the 2011 time frame. <clears throat> and then you see other Euro northern European uh, countries uh, uh, published. Of course, um, and it goes on, and Israel in 2011, and the establishment of the, uh, the Cyber Bureau, and Japan, who just actually republished their strategy five days ago. Um, it's not translated from Japanese yet, and it's not available online, and India just three weeks ago. And again, if I've missed your country, please come and see me. But one of the things that I see is missing, missing, out of everybody's strategy is the tie between economic productivity and prosperity and national security. Right now, in these austere times, our countries are focused on the economic aspects of, security, of our countries, about embedding that ICT into every part of our life because it promises productivity, it promises efficiency, it's core to the modernization agenda, and of course, innovation is how we're going to continue to prosper. But in the same breath, and in our national security strategies and in our cybersecurity strategies, we're talking about infrastructure protection, intellectual property protection, defense of the homeland, and yes, in some countries, we're talking about regime stability. Are these two in balance? I would argue that they're not. Because on the one hand, in every one of our countries, we're measuring that growth. We're measuring the fact that we have broadband to every last mile. We're being measured against each other, actually, within the measuring the information society, within the ITU for that broadband, on its price point, on its bandwidth, on its diversity. And we're being measured, and we're measuring our productivity and efficiency for ICT-enabled essential services. We're migrating to e-banking. We're migrating to a, a smart grid. We're migrating to a mobilized, virtualized business environment. And we're migrating to more collaborative platforms like social networking, like the cloud. 
and that promises an anywhere from 4 to 10% GDP growth. But are we measuring the liabilities? If you think about this as a business, we're not actually measuring this as a digital balance sheet. We have e-crime. We have IP theft. We are seeing disruption of services. We're actually seeing destruction of property. And identity theft and the fragility and the less resilient of these critical services is causing this to be a national security conversation. But if we don't measure the 4% minus the negative, then we won't actually get to a national conversation. So I'm going to give you two statistics, and they're not in writing. And they're from two other countries, because the United States hasn't measured this yet. So I'm going to first choose the United Kingdom has published a report that said that, of course, they're G20 country, that they're seeing 4% GDP growth from ICT-enabled services, and that they have measured a minimum of 3% GDP loss to e-crime and e-fraud, and potentially IP theft. So 4% minus 3% minus X% percent is probably net negative GDP growth, because we haven't actually secured our investments of ICT. The second statistic comes from the Netherlands, and they just republished a report out of the TNO, which is their research and development arm, that said that in 2010 that they saw only 2% GDP growth, and that they've measured at minimum 2% GDP losses from e-crime, e-fraud, and intellectual property theft. So are we actually realizing the investments that we've made over the last 30 years? I would argue not, because the security agenda is not aligned with the economic agenda. And in order to align it, you have to have a strategy that actually articulates the vision of the combining and the balancing of both. And it's not enough just to publish a strategy. If you don't have a strategy followed by an implementation plan that's measurable, that's specific, that's attainable, that has result-based objectives, then you won't actually see the vision achieved. And then you have to actually recognize that the resources really are scarce and that time is of the essence and that we've lost the time battle. And seeing that execution and measuring the performance and seeking continuous monitoring and learning from our mistakes and learning from other countries' mistakes is what's needed. And out of those 30 countries, we have some with visions or all with visions, some that have progressed on the continuum with implementation plans, others that are starting with execution, and then, and then they're actually reverting back to the main strategy that the strategy wasn't articulate enough and so that we have to go over and over and over again. And we have much to learn from each other because we're in different parts of this continuum. And we have to recognize that as we move forward with these strategies that the commitment and national resolve is not a election-based time frame that it's not an annual type of an event, that this is going to require a true investment over time and a commitment of resources in the competitive environment with extreme fiscal pressures that requires executive bandwidth, like CEOs of major corporations and leaders like uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Perez who have here, real commitment of their time. It's going to require real commitment of money from our countries and money from our companies. It's going to require political capital because there won't be pleasant choices along the way. And of course, time is of the essence. We need to recognize that this is not a government knows best approach, that it's going to require a true private public partnership. And I don't believe that regulation is the only approach. You have to consider the full gambit of resources and market levers. Subsidization will be required. Tax credits will be required, and of course regulation, regulation will be required, but not at the expense of other more incentive-based market levers. We have to recognize that this is an international and global We have to recognize that this is a global supply chain, and it's global products and services <clears throat> that we're all dependent upon each other. And that we have to embrace the next generation of innovation as we've talked to today and yesterday or Sunday. Uh, without creating unnecessary exposure of, of, to our economy or to our security.